Hi, I'm John, the MedPod engineer, and today I'm going to be looking at Dr. Sanjay Gupta's apology for misleading the American people on not doing his homework about marijuana. And uh, well, we'll see how good a job he does. One thing to remember, the girl he talks about in the video, the prime girl being saved by marijuana, is an epileptic, like Terry Parker. The guy in Canada who in 2000 proved with doctor's evidence that marijuana stopped epilepsy seizures. So it's not as if the cure for epilepsy hasn't been known for these past 13 years. Now in Canada, that's four dead epileptics a day who should have been exempted, who wouldn't have died. That's 20,000 after 13 years. Multiply by 10 for the states, that's 200,000 epileptics in the last 13 years. And uh, when you throw in the fact that's only 5% of the population, that's 4 million epileptics who died in the last 13 years across the planet, just the epileptics. Now that's nowhere as big as the 40 million a year due to poverty related diseases. Uh, that over the last 30 years, my career have taken over a billion people. But this is still pretty big genocide going on of the sick people by prohibition of their marijuana. So remember, epilepsy, we knew about that 13 years ago in Canada. It was proven at the time. So this is nothing new. Okay, here we are. Introduction to uh, Dr. Sanjay Gupta's big video coming up called Weed on CNN. This one's called Dr. Sanjay Gupta publicly apologizes for being so wrong about medical marijuana. Dr. Sanjay Gupta's documentary Weed, which airs on CNN this Sunday night. Sanjay spent a year investigating the fight over medical marijuana. More and more Americans are using it. Just a few days ago, Washington DC opened up its first medical marijuana dispensary. And CNN's chief medical correspondent, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, joins me. Now, Sanjay, welcome to you. Thank you. Thanks for having so, me. So, come on, you've been looking at this for a year. And I want to remind you that in 19, uh, 2009, you wrote a Time magazine article entitled Why I Would Vote No on Pot. You changed your mind. I, I have, and and uh, as part of uh, you know my thinking reason, I, I've apologized for some of the earlier reporting because I think you know we've been terribly and systematically misled in this country for some time, and I I was I did part of that misleading. You know, if, if you look at all the papers that are written in the United States about marijuana, the vast majority of them are about the harm. That we fund studies on harm, we don't fund studies on benefit nearly as much. So it gives, and you have to wonder. How did they find all these harms that we now found out weren't true? The distorted picture. But you know, I didn't look far enough. I didn't look deep enough. I didn't look at labs right. and other countries that are doing some incredible research. I didn't listen to the chorus of patients who said, not only does marijuana work for me, it's the only thing that works for me. I took the DEA at their word when they said it's a Schedule One substance and has no medical applications, yeah. there was no scientific basis for them to say that. So when, when New York Mayor Bloomberg was quoted as saying medical marijuana is the greatest hoax of all time, what do you say to I, I'm surprised, you know, I mean, I, I uh, follow a lot. I know there are dinosaurs still out there. Of the mayor's comments quite closely. I listened to those comments as well. He, it, it as part of those same comments, he was saying that the potency of marijuana has gone up. That is true. It has gone up probably over the last several years. But Not I, much. I urge him to look at the scientific papers. I was just looking at them again in preparation for your show. The science is there. This isn't anecdotal. This isn't the realm, in the realm of conjecture anymore. I mean, for a long time, we've just ignored these papers. But this was a drug, you know, that was used for thousands of years. Now, in your documentary, you Ignored get into all the those effects papers. of medical marijuana, which sometimes can be quite instant, it's quite dramatic. It, it, it really can. It works, and it can work very quickly. In fact, let, let me just show you. I always have two strains. I Meet 19-year-old Chaz Moore. He uses many different strains of marijuana, many of them high in CBD, to treat his rare disorder of the diaphragm. My ab will like lock up. That's why he's talking this way, almost speaking in hiccups, like he can't catch his breath. It's called myoclonus diaphragmatic flutter. This fluttering here, it's annoying, and it, but it becomes painful yeah. uh, pretty quickly, I imagine. Yeah. 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 After like 15, 20 minutes, this is where I can like start to really feel. He's about to show me how the marijuana works. He's been convulsing now for seven minutes. 
How quickly do you expect this to work? Within, like, the first five minutes. Not a big hit. <clears throat> and I'm done. Like, that's it. That's it. It was actually less than a minute. Depending on the attack and the day. I mean, that is pretty extraordinary. It, he, he was on so many different meds, peers. It, 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 was, it was a table full of meds that doctors had prescribed for him for this condition, including Oxycontin, Valium, any of those medications in too high a dose could have been really problematic, and they didn't Misled work. by whom? I mean, look, you know, the, the proof is, is, is becoming increasingly clear, I think, if you look for it. Let's take a short break. When we come back, we're going to get things a bit lively, Sandra. Why aren't doctors, doctors looking for it? The CEO of the Hills Treatment. Now, you, you and he have clashed horns before. We're going to do it again after the break because he does not agree with you. And he's been quite forceful about it. Let's get to that after the break. The official prohibitionist dinosaur. The medical marijuana controversy rages on in America. Should it be legal or not? Let's debate it backwards now. As Dr. Sanjay Gupta also joining us is Howard Samuels, who's a former addict turned founder of the Hills Treatment Center for Drug and Alcohol Rehabilitation. Howard Samuels, we spoke about this. You feel very strongly from your own experiences as a personal addict and treating other addicts that it's a real gateway drug, marijuana, and we should not be encouraging it to be legalized. Gateway. Still on that well, kick. Absolutely. I mean, I think that the doctor has a very good point that oh, for exactly. medical purposes, marijuana can be very, very useful. But you have to understand, the vast majority of people that use weed use it to get loaded. With prevention. Oh, he just means for the joy of it. Of prevention. It. They use it to get high. Oh. And look, I'm not I'd here to get drunk. say that it's, you know, worse than alcohol. Of course it's not worse. Of course than it's alcohol. not worse. But why in the world would we legalize another drug so our nation's I know. We've let you down by letting you get addicted to so many bad ones, we shouldn't let you get addicted to another. We'll do our job now. Why have another addiction out there? <laughs> you have another uh, substance to abuse and medicate their feelings with, you know, and this is to me the, the issue. We don't want to go from one extreme, reefer madness, which we know is a total exaggeration, but we don't want to go to the other extreme where we legalize this drug and endanger so many of our young people. Okay. <laughs> endanger the young people. It's the only one they got left, you know. But, okay, University of Saskatchewan in 2006, hey, seven years ago, had the study that showed that marijuana promotes neurogenesis, new brain cell growth. You have to keep asking yourself every time these dinosaurs talk about needing to protect the youth from new brain cell growth, you have to wonder why is it only good for guys like him who've lost a lot of brain cells and not good for kids who are growing new ones right now? I want to so, find a healthy balance. Okay, so let me throw that point well, aside. A That's healthy point balance. Made, quite reasoned. Keeping the cops, yeah. but I mean, let me look, smoke it, when it, you need it. It can be difficult to, to sort of stratify the legitimate patients who have use for cannabis, not only as a medication, but as the only medication for their suffering. And of course, you got to wait till you got it before you can use it to help. You can't prevent it yet. And as, as the doctor says, people who just want to get loaded or get high. That's true. But and if it's, it's no the, more harmful than alcohol or tobacco, preferable. why shouldn't it be legalized? Yeah. Well, isn't there an inconsistency in government policy? I, I, well, no, they failed with all those others, but they'll succeed with saving you from this one. <laughs> I think so. And, and let me take it a step further than that. I think it's irresponsible of the medical community not to offer this as an alternative. Two points. First of all, these other medications that we talk about for pain, for example, morphine, Dilaudid, Oxycontin, Vicodin, you name it. Every 19 minutes in this country, peers, in the United States, someone dies of an accidental prescription drug overdose. This is no joke. Every 19 minutes. As we investigate this, I couldn't find one documented case of someone dying of a marijuana overdose. We also you know that there's some situations like neuropathic pain, which is that lancinating, terrible pain people can get in their limbs or extremities. 
Sometimes marijuana is the only thing that can actually well, I, work. I, I've known someone with cancer who used it and it had a huge beneficial effects. I mean, my, my point to you, Howard Samuels, is this, is that I'm going to make a shocking revelation here. I've tried cannabis when I was a young, younger lad, and I've also had to have Vicodin when I broke some ribs, falling off, embarrassingly, a Segway uh, in Santa Monica. And I can tell you that it was the Vicodin uh, which I was prescribed by my doctor, which gave me a massively higher high than the cannabis ever did. I couldn't see the logic between making the Vicodin a legally prescribed drug and making cannabis this demonized drug. Explain to me the difference. Well, I have to agree with you. Oh, right? yeah. I have no but, disagreement with that. But. I mean, I don't have an issue with marijuana being used for certain pain things. I mean, of course it's safer than Vicodin. I mean, I've had patients die off Vicodin. I've never had anybody die off marijuana. But I have had people come to me, hundreds of people that I've had to treat that have addiction to marijuana. And they only admitted it to the judge before he sent them to his rehab center. How many people do you know ever went into a rehab center for laughing grass? <laughs> Grow too many brain cells, don't need to. That have serious emotional oh, side effects oh, as a result of that. Laughing so too much. I think the issue here is, you know, being able to decriminalize marijuana without question, but not making it legal. But let me ask you this really Let me ask you this then. Message okay, that, I think, that it's safe. Okay, well, it's not. Right, I think you're slightly softening your position though. Never killed anybody, but it's not safe. <laughs> from when I last spoke to you, because unless I'm wrong, you're real, the, the logical extension of your argument yeah. is that we should be banning all sorts of prescription drugs, yeah. probably alcohol as well, and tobacco. They should all be banned as well as cannabis, because that's the logical way of keeping your argument. Oh, but we, too late now, but we'll no, stop no, this one on time. And, and I'm sorry if, I mis <laughs> uh, if you misunderstood me, that all these drugs do have a place. The problem is that we don't have a medical restrictions that these drugs are all too open on the market for abuse, okay? Marijuana oh, needs to be no a controlled abuse. substance, <laughs> not legalized where we have commercials and we're sort of, you know, the corporations are talking about which drug to get loaded on, you know, marijuana okay. this, marijuana that. Okay. All right, now, you can always tell the prohibitionists because they always call the herb a drug. I think drugs, I think chemicals, I think pills. I don't think a herb. I don't think a plant, okay? They never call tobacco a drug, though it does have those kind of effects, but they always call marijuana a drug. So when do people use the word drug instead of substance or something more normal, herb is best, you know they got another agenda. The drug, he's a drug fighter. Let That's me, what I'm talking about. Okay, let me, we, get, a, we, let me get a sound check. We have to come up with a different concept. Okay. Ah, let me get, we have to come up with something new. Nothing's working. Any ideas, bozo? Never worked. Did they come up with anything new to fix prohibition with alcohol? Gee, no, they just had to get abolish it, right? Gee, I guess you're still looking for a way to come up with an answer to this problem. We got to pay him more money. Legalized or not? Let me go back to Sergio. Let me ask you, Sergio. I've made my stunning confession that I tried a bit of cannabis when I was younger. Have you tried it? I I, I have tried it. I, it's what a, effect did it have on you compared you know, to, say, drinking alcohol or whatever? Well, you know, the irony is, in, in some ways, because I work on this documentary, it was it was a while ago that I tried this. I, I didn't particularly care for it, actually. I, it, it made me kind of anxious, uh, and and it wasn't a, a very pleasant feeling, I think. And, and and, and, and I talked to a lot of people who've, who've had similar sort of experiences, but from a medicinal standpoint, that this idea that it can provide something that isn't already provided, I think the doctor, you know, he's really saying you're going to see ads for it, making it sound like it's some over-the-counter drug that everyone mm -hmm. can buy. Right now, it's listed as as the most dangerous substance. It's in the category of most dangerous Which substances in America. I think they, they, it's, it, this, the addiction is possibly real, about nine percent. Put it in context, cocaine is about 20%. That's actually considered less dangerous than marijuana. Mm -hmm. Alcohol is has a higher rate of addiction. Smoking, 30%. And, and that leads to far more deaths than marijuana. So it, it's, it's, it's I, I just don't quite understand the moral equivalence that the doctor is making here. Right. Uh, Howard Samuels, it's always good well, to talk to you. His point was, 
Yes, we failed you with all those other ones, but we'll save you from this one. There is, I'm not saying marijuana is more dangerous than cocaine. Of course it's not. Of course it's you not. Know? The, the U.S. That's government ridiculous. is saying that. Not I dangerous am saying, at all. Though, that marijuana should not be legalized because it is harmful Still to harmful. the emotional state of people have long-term exposure to it. And I've seen that in Cuba. <laughs> It harms the emotional state of people who laugh too much. <laughs> hey, the treatment field's gonna tell you. Get back to your meds there, Buster. Do the same thing. But isn't that, how is that, Let me jump in. Let me jump in. Isn't that also true, though, of so many other things? I mean, isn't it true of alcohol, Always. tobacco, Vicod, and everything else? Yeah. Is it you will have Without a percentage of people... Without question. Without question. Without question. Without but question. here's the point that Sam is making, is there has to be surely a consistency... But not to legalize it. Right. That's right, we're going to save you from this one. <laughs> they're doing the same what? thing. We're, we're giving more people an opportunity to get loaded. Oh. Why do we want to support that? He thinks being high from the generation of new brain cells is the same thing as being loaded? Okay, last word to you, Sanjay. Well, look, I, I, I'm not quite sure I follow uh, the, the doctor's argument here. I, I think it is <laughs> Pretty a logical. very effective medicine that has not been given a fair shake for 70 years in this country. I think it can treat things uh, that other medicines that exist now that are far more dangerous, far more toxic, lead to far more deaths, cannot treat. It's, it's bizarre to me, quite frankly. I think it's inhumane to these patients who, who, who can't get this treatment. I met patients in Colorado who, who can get treatment, but they can never leave their state. It, it's ridiculous. And, and the doctor, I think, maybe he would agree with me, maybe he won't, I'm not sure, I don't understand his position, but it is irresponsible, I think, of the medical community not to have this as an option. Absolutely. I, I don't want them getting loaded, as he says, on this stuff either. That's not the point. Right. The point is that we're trying to ha help take care of people, and we should not take marijuana off the table as an option here. Sanjay, got to leave it there. And, it and, I, you. and I, totally, I totally agree with oh, you. Oh, you shouldn't legalize it so our kids have an okay. option to get loaded on uh, the other <laughs> want to save the kids from regrowing new brain cells and getting loaded with all those new brain cells. Point. Okay. Hey, maybe they'd end up smarter than he did. Whatever drugs you use didn't work. Major point said very loudly and clearly it's a debatable carry on raging because <laughs> America is talking about this up and down the country. Token and dinosaur. And are beginning to legalize it for medicinal reasons. Anyway, Sanjay's documentary, Weed, as this Sunday at 8 p.m. on CNN. Our chief medical correspondent, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, has been working on a very interesting CNN documentary about medical marijuana, and it's called Weed. It debuts this weekend, uh, but the headline is so big, it can't wait. In a commentary you can read right now on CNN.com, Sanjay explains uh, in an article he entitles, Why I Changed My Mind on Weed. Entity writes, and I'm quoting, I apologize because I didn't look hard enough. Until now, I didn't look far enough. I was too dismissive of the loud chorus of legitimate patients whose symptoms improved on cannabis. Sanjay is back here in the Situation Room to tell us why. Yeah, you were going on in 2009 Parker for Time Magazine, Sanjay, which was entitled, Why I Would Vote No on Pot. Uh, so tell us briefly, why did you change your mind? Well, you know, I, I think a, a lot of it was, was in that quote. I, I, when, when you look at the literature surrounding marijuana, if you do a search for them through the medical journals, you know, some 20,000 papers would pop up. And I was keeping up steadily on the scientific literature. But what I was realizing was that the vast majority of these studies talked about the harm, the perils, the, the problems with marijuana. A very small percentage, less than 10%, close to 6%, actually evaluated benefit. So when you looked at all these studies in aggregate, Wolf, uh, you, you, you would think that there was, there was a distorted picture. You would think there was a lot more harm with marijuana than potential benefit. But it wasn't until I started looking at laboratories outside the United States, smaller laboratories Don't doing amazing States. work, <laughs> listening to the course of legitimate patients for whom not only did marijuana work, it was the only thing that worked, and, and that was quite stunning to me. I also looked closely at the DEA scheduling policy. They classify marijuana as a Schedule One substance, saying it's, it's in the category of the most dangerous substances out there. And when I looked carefully at that, I found there was really no scientific evidence to say it was that dangerous, that it had high abuse Zero. potential, and that it had no medical applications. I believe it does have medical applications, and that's, 
I just thought it was an important message to get out there. And you also lies. conclude, Sanjay, and I read your uh, excellent article, you conclude that in certain cases, medical marijuana is even more effective than various pharmaceutical drugs, right? Absolutely, and, and this is, again, uh, I think very important for people to hear the medical community is starting to, to, to understand this better, but this idea that, for example, neuropathic pain, that's this terrible sort of burning, lancinating pain patients have described to me. Now, oftentimes these patients, they're miserable, they get narcotics, uh, morphine, oxycontin, dilaudid. These Make types of happy. medications don't work, uh, maybe at all, but certainly not after a few months. People can develop tolerance to them, and you come to find that marijuana, in a, in a percentage of patients, not only does it work better than these narcotics, it's much safer. Because on the An interesting point is that you very often need to up your prescription. Once you hit the right amount of marijuana, it doesn't increase the tolerance, so you keep needing more and more and more and more. That's what's neat about self-titration. When they talk about, oh, the pot is twice as strong, well... You take half a puff, <laughs> or don't take two puffs. Stop when you know. Those narcotics, Wolf, you and I have talked about this, there's a death, an accidental overdose death from prescription medications every 19 minutes in this country. Those are dangerous medications. You know, they, they have a role, but they can be dangerous. Whereas with marijuana, I couldn't find a confirmed, a single confirmed overdose death. So you have something that works better, may, may work when other things don't, and probably much safer. And again, I think that's important for both patients in the medical community to hear. I right, bet. So medical marijuana serves a useful purpose. You conclude. What about recreational marijuana? What are the, the prevention? Recreation. Well, you know, I do make a distinction between these things, and I think it's important. I mean, I'm, I really am approaching the medical marijuana angle of this in many ways because I've seen so many legitimate patients with legitimate problems not be able to get the treatment they needed. But, 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 so I do make a distinction. But look, if you want to talk about, you want to raise the issue of moral equivalence with, with recreational marijuana and other substances that are out there, again, marijuana is considered a drug of high abuse, the highest abuse. Uh, dependence rates are around 9% as compared to alcohol, which is closer to 15, uh, heroin 23, 25%, cocaine 20%. So it's probably not as problematic as those, those, other, types of, those other types of drugs. What's I, I, I'm concerned about it as, as really far as mean. use for young Three people, grams people with a developing two. brain still up to age mid Fall asleep every but, night. You know, again, from a moral <laughs> equivalent standpoint, you'd be hard pressed to find additional harm from this in adults as compared to some of the other things. All right. Now to the big one, which I gotta go find. All right, changes his mind. CNN special, 42 minutes. This is the one. All right. The whole one. People are lighting up all over the country. They call it the green rush. Marijuana has moved out of the back alleys and into the open. Happy cannabis crop, y'all. In some states, it's legal to grow, to sell, to smoke, and marijuana could be legalized in a city near you. Notice you never see people falling over and barfing all over their friends. Notice? So easy to get, and many think so harmless. But when the smoke clears, I do. is marijuana bad for you? No. Or could pot actually be good for you? Yeah. Marijuana is better than all those pills for you in terms of treating? Yeah. I travel the world for answers. What does marijuana do to you? What does it do to your kids? A lot of good ones out there. Investigation. Weed. All right. Let's see your investigation. And I'll tell you what I found. Our journey begins here in this small town home nestled in the mountains with a family who has never allowed TV cameras in before. And you're going to soon learn why. This is so pretty out here. Yeah. They live in Colorado, one of two states where it's legal to smoke pot medically and recreationally. But here, it's also taboo to residents like Paige Figgy and her husband Matt. I'm sure it was mentioned to us by someone. Hey, you should try this. And I thought, no way. He thought that's fringe stuff. No that's... way, not a million years. Our government no. said it wouldn't work. No but medical value. Marijuana is far from fringe. Four joints, and do you yeah. want island sweet skunk? Medical dispensaries are everywhere. 
People are smoking in private clubs and public festivals. Wonderful. But none of this is for Matt. No fights! A military man. <laughs> and marijuana would be a career ender. I grew up in Wisconsin in a well-loving family, and I was educated that, like, oh, that's a drug. You don't do that. That's drug. And I never did. But just decades ago, marijuana was a legitimate medication, also called cannabis, prescribed by doctors and dispensed by pharmacies. Need it. This is Harry J. But that all changed in 1930. Responsible for a lot of dead people, Harry. Henry Ainslinger, the United States first drug czar. That's the man. For him, public enemy number one. That's the man who did it. You guessed it, marijuana. This guy saw how he... Now... I imagine heaven wouldn't be heaven if you couldn't slap around the bad guys who speeded up your trip to heaven. And I can imagine this guy being slapped around by lots of people. He could increase the budget of his uh, department. Ah, oh, come on, other uh, people wanted it prohibited. Going at the marijuana. You know, saying that there's this drug that the Mexican migrant workers are smoking and it's loco weed and it's going to make them crazy and they're going to rape your women. He got the anti-marijuana message out through news reports. Lies, propaganda. And then came this. And it worked. The film, Reefer Madness, portraying the users of marijuana as unproductive, <laughs> crazed. People are still afraid of what pot can do to them. In many ways, uh, to have defined our attitudes now for 70 years. Yeah. Well, marijuana not the last 30 anyway. In 1937. And by 1970, it was a Schedule I controlled substance. The government was saying it had no medicinal value and had a high potential for abuse. All reasons why the fit... Okay, and in the 1970s, they had their first evidence that it killed cancer. So, they specifically banned it and started the war against marijuana because they just didn't want people beating their cancers all that easily. The outlaw generation survives and the suckers die early. He stayed away from marijuana until this. And this might be hard for some of you to watch. It's okay, baby. This is their daughter, Charlotte, having a seizure. We just thought it was just one random febrile seizure. Nothing to really do, right. no medications. It's a fluke. Right. A fluke made sense. After all, Charlotte, nicknamed Charlie, was born perfectly healthy, a fraternal twin to Sister Chase. Charlie always had big, big smiles. Just the happy kids. Easy. I mean, yeah, yeah, easy, very much so. So it was around three months. Uh, you said that when you yeah. first noticed that yeah. Charlie had a seizure. I was changing her diaper, well, putting a new diaper on from after the bath, and her eyes just started flickering. It led to the first of many trips to the ER. They did the million-dollar workup, the MRI, EEG, spinal tap. You know, they did the whole workup and found nothing and sent us home. No abnormal blood tests, no abnormal scan. And developing normally, too, you know, talking and walking. And the same day as her twin, nothing was behind yet. By the time she was two, though, the seizures had become constant and started to take their toll on their once happy, joyful little girl. She started to really decline cognitively, and she was slipping away, and she just wasn't keeping up with her twin. The Figgies finally found an answer. It was awful news. Dravet syndrome. It is severe intractable epilepsy. The seizures are the first year of life his win. and are unstoppable, difficult to control, and very damaging. Severe behavioral problems, attention deficit, hyperactivity, the self-injury, you know, banging her head on the floor and pulling her hair out and like a possessed child. This isn't your perfect, happy Charlotte. It was a race against time. Many Dravet kids die young in early childhood. Charlotte was almost three. For the next two years, the Figgies tried everything. Strange diets, acupuncture, and dozens of powerful drugs like Valium, Ativan, Phenobarbital, but nothing seemed to help. Even worse, some of the medications nearly killed her. After one dose, she stops breathing, and after two doses, her heart will stop. Did you have to do CPR then on her yourself? Yes. I remember when her heart stopped and I had her pulse, and I lost her pulse. There was just nothing. The ambulance is on its way. 
She survived. Mm. You're okay. Mommy's here. But now it was fall of 2011, and Charlotte was five years old. When things are at their worst, she just sees all night, and the kids are sleeping either in my room or next to her. They can hear her seizure scream all night, 50 times a night. And Chase would come in in the morning and just, this is her twin, <laughs> and just hug her and, like, rub her head and say, I'm, so, I'm just so glad you survived through the night last night. Matt had been deployed to Afghanistan, and the only thing he could do to help was start scouring the Internet. And he stumbled onto this video of a child using marijuana. So how's everything going? She had four days without a seizure. I'm like, wow, this is having seizures. He didn't find it on the mainstream media, did he? It's interesting, it's natural. And while he couldn't ever imagine taking marijuana himself, he was now in the stunning position of recommending it for Charlotte. I was like, we need to do this. And I said, I don't know. Charlie, there you are. And Not then, so bad. Charlotte's condition got worse. Oh, yeah. 300 seizures a week. Wow. Almost two every... Wow, that's 40 seizures a day. Terry Parker used to have 80 seizures a day. Wow. No wonder they did two lobectomies. Yeah, Nothing worked. Not talking or moving. Basically catatonic. As a last resort... Doctors wanted to either prescribe a powerful veterinary drug used on epileptic dogs or put Charlotte in a medically induced coma so her brain and body could rest. For Paige, those were not good options. But maybe, just maybe, marijuana now was. But she was about to find out how hard that would be. This isn't go to the pharmacy and yeah. pick up your medicine. There was no protocol. When we come back, what will the figgies do? And what would you do if this were your dog? Buy a gun and try and find a dealer. <laughs> Get into the underground world. I had resigned myself. I don't think she's going to survive this. We've seen her flatline in the hospital. We've said goodbye. You're listening to Matt and Paige Figgy describe their own daughter. What would you do if this were your child? Charlotte Figgy had an extreme form of epilepsy. Her body was so frail that any seizure could kill her. With no traditional treatment left to try and the clock ticking away, her parents decided to try marijuana. Charlotte was just five years old. You need a card in order to be able to get the cannabis from a pharmacy. Doctors have to prescribe it. You need two doctors in Colorado uh, to get the card for a, a juvenile or a child. It was hard. We were the first young child, and they said no. Everyone said no, 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 no. Certainly her age played a, played a role in, in my hesitance. Dr. Alan Shackelford is a Harvard-trained physician. He's also among a handful of doctors in Colorado who give prescriptions for medical marijuana. From the moment Charlotte entered his office, he knew she was in trouble. While he was just examining her, she had two seizures. She'd failed everything. Uh, there were no more options for her. Everything had been tried, except cannabis. Here's how scientists think it might work. Marijuana is made up of two ingredients. THC, that's the psychoactive part that makes you high, and CBD, also called cannabidiol. What does making you high mean? Is that when you start giggling, laughing? What's high versus the parts that heal you without feeling like laughing. What does high mean, as opposed to drunk? It's the CBD that scientists think modulates electrical and chemical activity to help quiet the excessive activity in the brain that causes seizures. I've been telling my patients about that. Dr. Julie Holland is the editor of The Pot Book, a complete guide to cannabis. For a long time, the work on cannabis and epilepsy was sort of inconclusive. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. They couldn't quite figure it out. And it's only when they really started separating THC from CBD that they saw, you know, definitively, yes, CBD seems to really stop seizures. So people who just smoked marijuana and got their CBDs with their THC still didn't get seizures. But they're going to look for a way to get rid of the... THC, so they only get CBDs because they don't want them getting high. 
So the Figgies needed to find something that was rare, a strain of marijuana that was low in THC. Of course, they didn't want Charlotte getting stoned, Ooh, but stoned. also high in CBD to treat her seizures. And that wouldn't be easy. Dispensaries and growers, they make their money off strains that are high in THC. I'm Joel. I'm Josh. No one knows that better than the Stanley brothers. Their family business is pot. And if you look at these clean-cut guys and what you see surprises you, don't worry. They've heard it all before. When we were on the corner, they're like, oh, wait a second. You know, did you finish high school? <laughs> they all not only finished high school, but also college, and in some cases, graduate school. Now, they are some of Colorado's biggest growers and dispensary owners. They produce up to 600 pounds of medical marijuana a year, and much of that marijuana is high in THC. But here, on their remote farm at this undisclosed location in the mountains... It takes a lot of plants. We're, we're allowed to grow six per patient. They have been growing something different, something they call revolutionary. It's a greenhouse one. Greenhouse one. Yes, welcome to it. Welcome wow. to paradise. Behind closed doors and under tight security, we enter what the Stanleys call the Garden of Eden. There's nothing like this in the world. This plant's 21% CBD and less than 1% THC. It took years of crossbreeding plants to get to this point. Instead of breeding up the THC, we've bred down the THC and bred up the CBD. And people said, you're crazy. You know, who's going to smoke that? So why grow it then? Well, the Stanleys also believed in CBD's potential to treat many diseases. And they had seen it change lives before. I always have too strict. I Meet 19-year-old Chaz Moore. He uses many different strains of marijuana, many of them high in CBD, to treat his rare disorder of the diaphragms. My ab will, like, lock up. That's why he's talking this way, almost speaking in hiccups, like he can't catch his breath. It's called myoclonus diaphragmatic flutter. This fluttering here, it's annoying, and, but it becomes painful yeah. um, pretty quickly, I imagine. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, after like 15, 20 minutes, this is where I can like start to really feel. He's about to show me how the marijuana works. He's been convulsing now for seven minutes. How quickly do you expect this to work? Within like the first five minutes. Should hit his brain in 20 seconds. <clears throat> and I'm done. Like, that's it. That's it. It was actually less than a minute. Depending on the attack in the day, like, it'll work within the first couple hits. Hear how his voice is completely different. That attack lasted eight minutes. But some have lasted much longer and happen as often as 40 times a day. And like Charlotte, he had tried so many things before. By 16, Chaz was taking these powerful, addictive, potentially deadly narcotics and muscle relaxants daily, like Valium and morphine. It would be safe to say that that marijuana, what you have in your hand there, is better than all those pills for you in terms of treating what's yeah, going on? Yeah, I wouldn't, I'm not zombified. I've had 16, 17 attacks today, and I'm still sitting up talking to you. My first attack on all these, I'd be in the hospital. I'm a firm believer that marijuana has actually saved my son's life. Chaz's father, Sean. His uh, quality of life now is a thousand times better than what it was when he was on the pharmaceuticals. A quality of life that Paige Figgy desperately wanted for her daughter Charlotte. But she still had one hurdle to cross. Convincing dispensary owners like the Stanleys to sell marijuana to a five-year-old little girl. When Strike it high! Home, my brother Joel and the brothers had a meeting. So tell us about this patient. She's five years old, he said. And we said, oh, no, we can't do that. Why? It was the fear of the unknown. Charlotte was the youngest patient at the time wanting marijuana. Would it be too much for her? Or would it change her life forever? We'll find that out later. But first, learn more about what marijuana does to your kid's brain. And yours as well. Let's see if he mentions neurogenesis. April 20th, Denver, Colorado. Breathe, 
tens of thousands from around the country and the world lighting up legally. Happy cannabis crop, y'all. Legally? For some, it's a lifestyle. For others, it's a lifeline. We're working with the Lucas Foundation and Rupert Arthritis. But for all of them, I wonder, what was it doing to their brains? Some of my patients call me pot doc. Your patients call you pot doc? Neurogenesis. What does it do to your brain? Their the medical brain cells. Dr. Stacy Gruber is serious about pot. I want you to name the color and not to read it. Okay. I met her in her labs at McLean Hospital near Boston. She's using high-tech imaging to see what happens in the brain when you smoke. When you first smoke, that is, you know, you light up a joint, a spliff, a blunt receptors, which are throughout the brain, um, respond. And these areas of the brain are responsible for things like pleasure, memory, learning, sensation. Learning. A sense of time and space, coordination, movement, yeah. appetite, and other drives, shall we say. So it's sort of um, an all-over impact, right? So re reward, pleasure, hunger. No danger. Um, you, you have this, this overall feeling of, of well-being, they say. That all sounds pretty good. Yeah. But it does sound pretty good. Yeah. And it's not just feeling good. But there's this phenomenon reported by many smokers over the years. Laughing grass. famous artists. Laugh a lot. The ability to be more creative. Yeah, I think so too. When you feel that high, there's sort of a release of dopamine. And your brain sort of has the ability now to perceive things slightly differently from the way you might have if you hadn't been smoking pot. What you really see is this reduction in inhibitory function. Uh. Welcome, Dr. This is pretty spectacular. Let's see, dream Let's more inhibition. reduction in That's inhibitory that function. That's something Amir says helps him be more creative. A successful artist, his canvases sell for up to $25,000. Ask any musician. It's my favorite way to work. So, Using marijuana. Yeah. He's been painting for 14 years, smoking for even longer. He says it makes him feel more relaxed, but most importantly for him, he says it makes him less critical of his own work. Stop worrying so much about this and that, and just sort of looking and being as, as present as possible. Amir does caution that it's a delicate balance for him. It would make me very apprehensive, as maybe a little paranoid, just too analytical. You can get paranoid, you can have disorganized thinking, you get disoriented. Um, it can New brain be, cells. Uh, comfort can lead to panic attacks that or anxiety attacks. And I'm getting smarter, I'm panicking. Much. Uh, simple tasks become very frustrating, like mixing paint, and then just sort of get into this state of, duh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no more hits today. <laughs> now. And why that happens is exactly what Columbia University neuroscientist Carl Hart is investigating. Exhale. Research subjects in his lab smoke marijuana and then take a variety of cognitive tests. The effects will be disruption in memory, disruptions in inhibitory control, they will become slower at cognitive functioning. Ah, oh, jeez, what a bunch of bull! My God! Marijuana in general makes people gentler, except in cases of power games. And you know that the great Canadian gambler has spent a lot of time fighting over life support chips at the poker table. Not true. I mean, it makes musicians play better, it gives people more inspiration, and they're now trying to tell us that all that great stuff makes you slower and stupider. And how can you believe that? How can you believe this? wide range of things. These effects are temporary, but they're pretty pronounced and they are clear. Yeah. And it's slowly becoming clear to scientists what part of the brain is most affected. It's the prefrontal cortex. It's very important for planning, uh, thinking, coordinating your behavior. Inspiration. There are yeah. tons of marijuana receptors in this region. And we think that Tons of receptors ready for marijuana if you can just get it. All of those uh, behaviors. You think they're there to slow you down? Cautions could be dangerous, especially when driving. You may prematurely. Come on now, think about it. Would there be so many marijuana receptors in your brain if filling them with cannabinoids really were going to slow you down? 
Is your brain really that stupid to have hands out for these cannabinoids that it really couldn't hurt itself? Come on, this is too stupid. Hit your brakes, you may prematurely hit the gas pedal. Oh, oh my range of things. Jeez. Causes accidents, which is why the United States insurance companies say that people who drive high have less accidents. They've paid out less claims. Gee, I guess he must be wrong or lying. Yeah, it might hit the brakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, make a turn without looking more. Gee, you could do that without smoking too. Oh, and high drivers do it less. I mean, yeah. Carefully. Hey. Look at this experiment done. Hey, Gupta's investigation wasn't very good there, was it? <laughs> hey, I bet she's not going to mention the fact that high drivers have less accidents and it's been proven by the insurance company payouts. Oh, look at driving. They're going to tell us about how it makes you a worse driver. That's why you'll have less accidents. <laughs> Here we go. I see an affiliate KIRO in Washington State. Subject smoked marijuana and then drove. One was a daily medical marijuana smoker, and another an infrequent weekend smoker. All right, a newbie, maybe. Buzz. Infrequent weekend. What's that? One weekend a year? The more trouble behind the wheel. Oh yeah. Watch yourself. Watch yourself. The newbie had trouble. The habitual smoker didn't have as much trouble. As much? I thought she should have less accidents. Something I witnessed firsthand driving around with 19-year-old Chaz Moore. Oh, good. The day that I spent with him. He had been smoking all day long. Do you feel impaired at all? No, I no. don't feel normal. No. Turns out I'm you know, high, not drunk. People who have a lot of experience with cannabis, you don't see many disruptions. Ah. But you test people who have a sort of a limited history. Newbies. You can see some get scared. Announced disruptions. Of course, no one thinks <laughs> that driving when using marijuana is a good idea. Oh, really? I, I do. Answer is if there is a safe legal limit. Ah, oh God, he's gonna spend time looking for a safe legal limit to this impairment by marijuana, which makes you a safer driver. Wasting your time, Sanjay, you didn't check the insurance companies, did ya? And the people who she use cut this. daily as a medicine should be able to drive. That yeah, had no effect on your guy. What is more clear, though, is the effect of marijuana on the young brain. Oh, we yes. There's a very big difference in people who begin to smoke prior to the age of 16 and those who smoke after age 16, what we call early versus later onset. 16 is the big brain date. Scans show that the white matter, those are the highways that help the brain communicate from one point to another, are impaired in those who start smoking early. Maybe that there's underlying Too many brain right cells. Now, connectivity differences. That, that's, your, that's your concern, it sounds like, that the, those highways, those white matter highways, are just more disrupted in people who start smoking early. That's, that's what we see. Perhaps. All right. Okay. If you're growing all the new brain cells earlier, maybe the highways will be a little more disruptive, a little fuller, a little more congested with new brain cells. Maybe they got a point. <laughs> Not surprising, given what we know about the young developing brain. Yes, tell that's us. That's a very delicate time in brain development, and that's not a good time to be taking any drugs. Ah. Yeah, okay, I would guess that if you're going to take drugs that destroy brain cells, it's not the time to be taking any drugs. But this ain't drug, it's herb, and it regrows brain cells. So why talk about the destructiveness of drugs when we're talking about marijuana, the herb? Oh yes, they can bring in all the destructive statistics from all drugs and impute that to marijuana. Sad, eh? Lousy research, Sanjay. The research shows that early onset smokers are slower at tasks, oh. have lower IQs later in life, higher <laughs> risk of strokes, and increased incidence of psychotic disorders. Oh, God! Where did he get this bullshit? Holy sh... Growing brain cells increases your chances of psychotic disorders! Ah! <laughs> and while these studies are not conclusive, some scientists are still concerned. Ah, their studies aren't conclusive, but the scientists are still concerned. Did I ever tell you how they do concern? They use double negatives. Doctor, can you prove that marijuana doesn't cause freckles? Well, never heard of it, but I can't prove it doesn't. Okay, it might cause freckles. Can you prove marijuana doesn't cause athlete's foot? 
Well, I never heard of it, but could cause athlete's foot. Okay, put down could cause athlete's foot. You ever heard maybe that marijuana could cause aliens want us to invade and collect our marijuana from us? Well, I never heard of that, but I can't know if aliens want to invade our world to get our marijuana. Okay, put down maybe alien invasion possible because of marijuana, and then you list all the possibilities that these guys are concerned about, especially alien invasion, and ask a judge to ban it. And the judge goes, well, I can see what all these concerns, athlete's foot and this and alien invasion, of course he's going to ban it. Just more of, they don't have any proof, but they feel concerns. Doctors, low-tech scientists. 2012, 35% of high school seniors lit up. And that could mean a generation of kids with damaged brains. Wow, those new brain cells crowding them out. Yeah, damaged brains. <laughs> Doesn't it help to know about neurogenesis to be able to laugh at Dr. Sanjay's hit job? And many fear something else. I never really told myself I needed help. Ooh. A generation of marijuana addicts. Addicts! When we oh. come back, the truth and the science behind what's being called a growing epidemic. And later, <laughs> Charlotte's... Now let's remember, this epidemic of people in rehab are usually there as an alternative to jail, right? So, uh, fun story. story. The first and youngest child to try marijuana in Colorado. Anyway, that really pissed me off about the brain cell stuff, damaged brains. This was the day Chaz Moore almost died. Pumped full of drugs like morphine, dilaudid, Valium, to quiet a non-stop 48-hour attack. I thought I was going to overdose, and yeah, it was pretty bad. At his bedside, his father, Sean, watched his son go from being catatonic to what he calls high as a kite. How high are you on the porches? I'm not, I'm not high on <laughs> you. I've watched friends of mine die from taking the same drugs that he took. You see, Sean was a drug addict, and he had struggled for decades to get clean. It was scary. It was really important for him not to take these drugs if he could avoid them. If he could avoid them. I know how addictive they are. I've seen it. It scared the hell out of me. Marijuana is the most but addictive. Sean is not scared of marijuana, and neither is Chaz. This right here, I don't get sick off of it. I can't overdose. And Chaz is right about that. While there are fatal, accidental prescription medicine overdoses every 19 minutes in this country, there are virtually no reports of fatal marijuana overdoses. And it's perhaps one of the biggest reasons most people think pot is safe. Virtually no. In fact, no. The U.S. Census. So that by high Statistics. School, only one in five think marijuana is harmful. That's the lowest number in more than two decades. And it's something we heard over and over as we traveled around the country. Not really that harmful it has a lot of benefits not really too concerned about it i think it's safe if you're a safe person probiotics but the experts we spoke to said there is more to the story that is. people who compulsively smoke who want to stop smoking but they can't stop smoking and there are people who compulsively gamble and can't stop gambling and people who compulsively do all sorts of stuff and because a few compulsives are going to do anything, is that a reason to ban it for everyone else? In fact, 9% of marijuana users will become dependent. Now, that's not as high as other drugs, like heroin. 23% of users become addicted. I want to explain the difference between dependence and addiction. Um, I'm addicted to chocolate ice cream, and I will eat it when it's there. Cannot resist. But when it's not there, I don't go through withdrawal. I guess I'm addicted to marijuana. I like to smoke it when it's there. But I don't go through withdrawals when it's not. 
and I tested that conclusively back in 1993 when the judge had sentenced me to community service playing my accordion in old folks' homes for the Robin Hood raid on Casino Termel, and I had to do concerts at the end of every month and the beginning of the next one, 10 hours each. Then I'd go to Atlantic City for six weeks to play poker, back for two weeks of concerts, back to Atlantic City, back for two weeks of concerts, six weeks in Atlantic City, and I would go back and forth and I'd be straight down in prohibition zone and when I get back to Canada I could smoke. Boy those first nights back were incredibly inspirational as the brain just like all the things I'd been mulling 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 in my straight state suddenly wow exploded into thought. Very very inspirational mentally when I'd come back but when I'd go back to the United States after a couple of weeks of smoking pretty regularly no withdrawal. I didn't miss it. I didn't have cravings. So it's just like chocolate ice cream. It's as addictive as chocolate ice cream, perhaps, maybe less, I don't know. But uh, it's certainly not because of no withdrawals to be called an addiction at all. Or 17% with cocaine, or 15% with alcohol. But it's still approximately one out of every 11 marijuana smokers. <laughs> There's no longer any scientific debate that marijuana is not just psychologically addictive, but also physically addictive. Oh, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Update, I just told it? you it wasn't. Dr. Christian Thurston uh, runs one of Colorado's right, largest gun substance abuse treatment clinics. The oh, number of marijuana it's his job. He gets paid. has tripled in the last three years alone. Literally. Wow, the number of marijuana addicts has tripled. Hey, tell me if they came from a judge's order or not before you give me those numbers, okay? I know nobody who's ever had to go turn himself in for rehab for laughing grass. <laughs> but this guy's got a job and he's got three times more customers. Wow! Either marijuana's dangerous or prohibition's really working. Yeah, I cried about it. Oh, marijuana yeah, they cried. Marijuana is cry. number one on their list of priorities. They have dropped out of life. <laughs> Back in the day, I wouldn't feel like my day has really started if I didn't get high. Joel Vargas started smoking when he was just 13. By 15, he was smoking more than a dozen times a day. He stopped skateboarding. He even dropped out of school. I like getting high. I need to get high because my brain is telling me. Adolescents starting at about his brain 13 them? have a pretty mature brain reward center. So they can experience rewards and pleasures the same way adults can. Oh, feels good but for the them too. The problem with that is that their prefrontal cortex, which helps people think ahead, um, control their impulses, that's not fully developed until age 24. Ooh. That explains why adolescents are much more vulnerable. To what? <laughs> to the presumed threat of the drug. There's something else that addiction experts believe is likely happening in the brain. When you smoke pot, the feel-good chemicals that make up marijuana, called cannabinoids, remember them? Yeah. They cause your brain to stop producing its own natural cannabinoids. When you stop smoking, you have no feel-good cannabinoids of your own. Until your body Why? Can't you start production. them up again? You feel lousy. So many people smoke again. Come on now. How many people feel lousy the next morning after a good night's sleep and they have to take it again? Ah, oh, Sanjay, how could you put out such crap? To feel better. To feel better? Today's marijuana could be more addictive. It has more of the psychoactive ingredient THC than ever before. Not much. Brain researcher. Dr. Nora Volkov. Since you smoke a very potent marijuana, the 9-THC content is going to go very fast into your brain at a relatively high concentrations, and then that increases its rewarding effects and its likelihood of transition into addiction. And it saves you from taking two tokes. <laughs> Therefore, you'll get addiction by taking it only in one toke. So how much stronger is it? You see the barbed wire, obviously, on the, on the fences. Well, I traveled to Mississippi, where marijuana is illegal. But here, on the campus of one of the country's oldest universities, Ole Miss, 
a huge stash of marijuana is under lock and key. Leaf, no bud. This is some pretty tight security. I mean, look at this door. Mahmoud El Soli runs what's called the Marijuana Potency Project. What's the potency of this? It's about 8%. For three decades now, his team has analyzed weed confiscated from drug busts. This is 36% uh, THC. You can smell it. It has a, a, a good aromatic you know, smell. Talk. How much does this worry you? 36% THC confiscated. It's very, very dangerous material. <laughs> You only need a small toke to feel better. Can't take a big one. <laughs> Dangerous. Oh, Lord. A lot of experience in marijuana smoking. Take some of this, and they're going to go into the negative effects of the high. Um, and that's going to put them right to sleep. <laughs> the negative effects. Lots of THC, the psychosis, the irritation, the irritability, the... Irritability from laughing too much. And while not all the plants are this high, there's no question he's seen a trend. In 1972, the average potency was less than 1% THC. Bullshit. Okay. Throughout all of the history of marijuana I've ever known and read about, it's historically been about six. And there were times when people would claim higher numbers and people would do tests and always come back to close to six on the streets. And, of course, there were the other ones like Thai Stick and Sensimili and the famous ones where you just needed small tokes before you got red eye. But in the old days, you took a toke, you got red eye. That's how stoned you got. When was the last time you got red eye with today's stuff? One percent. Ah, they can't exaggerate it going the other way. It's 80 percent THC, so they exaggerate it on the other side. Got it from 6 down to 1%. So if it's now 18%, they can go 18 times bigger when it's really 3. Maybe they have bred 3 times, 4 times more. But still, they're trying to make it up into like 18. Come on. Now, it's nearly 13%. Oh, 13 times stronger today. Ah, when it's really only twice the 6% of history. Yeah, people becoming more obsessed. Still, with price is pretty good. THC marijuana. I think so. They start out with a half a percent or one percent, and they get a good high, and then as they continue to use that, it doesn't give them the same high anymore. A special investigation. Oh, and we just talked about that. When was the last time anybody you know had to keep smoking more and more and more and more pot like other drugs? It doesn't happen. Oh, the expert is wrong again. <laughs> It happened to Joel Vargas. Oh, After one a couple of years of smoking daily, Joel eventually ended up in rehab, where he faced mild withdrawal symptoms. How did he end up in rehab? Did he say, Mama, I want to go to rehab, please? Or did some judge say, Would you like to go to rehab or go to jail? <laughs> you didn't tell us the whole truth, Sanjay. The irritability, insomnia, nausea. Oh. It certainly isn't anything nearly as dangerous as abrupt discontinuation of alcohol. You know, for somebody like Joel, going into rehab is really about learning new behaviors. So nothing actually physical, you know, just learning new, learning how to not smoke marijuana like the judge told him to. <laughs> learning new behavior. <laughs> More than it is not as illness. treating the physiological dependence or tolerance. See, there or there is no physiological issues. dependence. Joel's been clean now for six months. Ooh. But these kinds of risks, they don't scare off oh, Charlotte Figgins. The risks. Yeah. People ask us that a lot, like, you know, how did you make that decision? It wasn't a decision. It, wasn't a decision. it was the next viable option. And some would say a radical option. Marijuana for a five-year-old. Wow. The they hoped would change her life forever. Baby. When we come back, Matt and Paige Figgy finally give their Charlotte marijuana the results are shocking she died <laughs> it was january 2012 afghanistan about 7,000 miles away from his family in colorado matt figgy received this video from his wife Paige. it's horrible seeing these videos when i'm deployed 
It was his five-year-old daughter, Charlotte, seizing. Diagnosed with a severe form of epilepsy, she was having 300 seizures a week, each attack so severe it had the potential to kill her. They had already tried dozens of high-powered drugs. We needed to try something else. And no, at that that time, marijuana was that natural course of action to try. At home in Colorado, Paige searched for marijuana high in CBD. That's the ingredient some scientists think helps seizures. And also low What if it was the THC? <laughs> she didn't want to get her daughter stoned. She found a small amount at a Denver dispensary. The owner was surprised that anyone would even want it. They said it's funny because no one buys this, you know. Um, that was the general consensus, that nobody wanted it. It didn't have any effect. Paige paid $800 for a small bag and took it home. I had a friend that was starting a business on making medicine, and I said... How small a bag? Grocery bag? <laughs> Can you help me extract the medicine from the, this bag of marijuana? <laughs> I measured it with a syringe and squirted it under her tongue. It was exciting and very nerve-wracking. Holding Charlotte in her arms, Paige waited. An hour ticked by, and then another, and then another. She didn't have a seizure that day. And then she didn't have a seizure that night. Did you sit there and yeah. look at your watch? And... Right, I thought, this is crazy. And then she didn't have one the next day. And then the next day, and I thought, that is, she would have had 100 by now. And I just, I know, I just thought, this is insane. I remember how happy Paige was, like, it's really working. I can't believe it. Yeah, that was, that was pretty amazing to hear. It had worked. But in just a couple of weeks, the excitement was overshadowed by panic. Paige was running out of marijuana, and the dispensary didn't have any more of that particular strain. Even if there was more, the monthly price tag would have been astronomical, $2,000, and not a penny of it covered by insurance. But then Paige heard about the Stanleys, the six brothers, and their greenhouse of marijuana that is high in CBD. I said, oh my goodness. He says, I don't know what to do with it. We're trying new things with it, but no one wants it. It's not sellable. I said, just don't, don't touch that because we need that plant. At first, they didn't want to take the risk of giving marijuana to such a young child. But then they met her. Tell me about the first time you met Matt, Paige, and Charlotte. I get you uh, misty-eyed. Yeah, you get all of us crying when we start talking about that little girl. The Figgies had hit the jackpot, a steady supply of high CBD marijuana, and they only had to pay what they could afford. People have called us the Robin Hoods of marijuana. They say that we sell pot so that we can take care of the kids and the truly less fortunate. Charlotte was the first of those kids. Late spring, 2012, she tried the Stanley Special Marijuana, and again, it worked. I can't tell you what that what that means to us. Get you, get you a dozen in a little bit. <laughs> if it doesn't get you, something's wrong with you. She lived her life in the catatonic state. Now her parents get to meet her for the first time. What a revelation. Yeah, gee. The child, who had had 300 seizures a week, was now down to just one every seven days. <laughs> Bitter pat, tiptoe. When I first met Charlotte, March of 2013, it was one year after that first dose of marijuana. A two. <laughs> after almost two years on a feeding tube, she was now eating on her own. Yellow? Yeah, she was talking, even walking. Yeah, oh, please, she said, please. But these stories, they are not without their skeptics. One of the country's two hospitals dedicated to Gervais syndrome in Florida states at present, there is no evidence that cannabidiol is effective for the treatment of epilepsy. And in Canada, the Terry Parker case proved that it was. 13 years ago. But they still found a researcher in the States to say there's no proof it works yet, and yet the courts in Canada accepted that it did, specifically for epilepsy. 
Where'd they find him? A researcher. The American Academy of Pediatrics also opposes cannabis, ah. as does the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Oh, of course you'd expect the National Institute on Drug Abuse to be against the herb, but the pediatricians, the baby doctors? Think about all the children like her who've been suffering all these years and wouldn't have been if it hadn't been for the pediatricians. Gotta get the pediatricians. It is such an amazing turn of events. I that know, right? It really can't be a flu, but I do still wonder. Do you still wonder too? Yeah. Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> you know it's working. It's working great. You just look wonderful. And Charlotte's doctor, Alan Shackelford, also agrees. Yet his commitment to medical marijuana has drawn criticism. He's even been called Dr. Feelgood. How difficult is this what for you to talk about as a physician? Well, we are typically conservative as a, as a profession and, and probably as individuals. We want more proof and cannabis doesn't have that. And it's why he has sure traveled the world to look for researchers who might have the answers. And that took him to the place many call the medical marijuana research capital. Israel. It might surprise you, but actually research into cannabis and epilepsy started here in the 1970s with studies that showed it could reduce convulsions in rats. Today, Shackelford is hoping to start clinical trials in humans there. And the narcs in the states knew well enough that they won't be reluctant to at least give it a thought, at least try it. And At least not, think about it, doctors. You do have an oath. ...are studying a variety of illnesses. When we come back, what they're finding, up close, and an amazing look inside hospitals and nursing homes... Seems good for everything. ...courtesy of the Israeli government. city of Jerusalem, the final leg of our journey was just beginning. There have been some great advances here, and I'm proud of that, obviously. Dr. Boaz Lev is with Israel's Ministry of Health. Here, they have pioneered marijuana research. They were the first to isolate THC and CBD decades ago. And now the country's ministry licensed 10,000 patients to use marijuana medicinally and has approved more than a dozen studies to treat illnesses like PTSD, pain, Crohn's disease, even cancer. Hopefully, this would prove to be the best medication. I really hope so. We're not there yet. I think we the are. might come from places like this. It's a state-run nursing home outside of Tel Aviv. Residents here are using marijuana for pain, loss of appetite, Parkinson's disease, and dementia. Moshe Root is one of those residents. He was 77 when he smoked his first pipe of marijuana. He's 80 now, and he smokes a couple of times a day. It's to help with the pain and the hand tremors caused by a stroke. So it's a mixture of tobacco and marijuana. He even decided to light up during our interview to stop his hands from shaking. You're saying your hands are steady because of the marijuana? It also helped ease a deeper pain hidden from sight. You see, Moshe is a Holocaust survivor. When his wife died a couple years ago, he was haunted by nightmares of his childhood, hiding from the Nazis. The marijuana, he says, took him out of the darkness. You dream. You fly. When you, when you smoke. Yeah. There are 19 other patients here. Scientists at Tel Aviv University are now studying their progress, and they call the results outstanding, including weight gain, improved mood, pain, and tremor reduction. But I can tell... Improved mood from laughing grass? I you as a doctor, it was my next stop that proved the most surprising. Cancer. This is Israel's largest hospital, Sheba Medical Center. You put up your uh, medical cannabis. Amashe is using marijuana to help him with the pain and nausea from chemotherapy. Filling up this balloon, so that's your medicine inside there. Oh, I'm gonna take it out. Put up the 
and he's doing it inside the hospital. How are you feeling? I really, first of all, in the muscle, in the leg. And you're not worried about any, any potential damage to your body? No, no. <laughs> I, I really, I really believe I can be cancer free for a long time if I continue, uh, you know, consume cannabis. Yes, he said cancer free. Finally. Very early studies on mice in Israel, Spain, and the United States How early? are now showing the potential of marijuana oh. to kill Jesus. cancer cells. It's exciting research, but it is still in its infancy, and it's inconclusive. Oh, inconclusive, he thinks. This Sheba is well established, and experts say a teaching tool for using marijuana in other hospitals. Do you think this could happen in the United States? I don't know that there's yet enough really concrete evidence of cannabis's benefit uh, that, that's satisfactory, at least in that context. I think it's going to come. But it could be slow going. The FDA has been great at approving studies, but National Institute of Drug Abuse has been really stonewalling and blocking any studies looking at their jobs are at stake. Cannabis because that's not their mandate. Their mandate is to look at the harms that's of drug right. use. It's very easy to blame an organization. Dr. Nora Volkoff, who is the director of NIDA, says they are not standing in the way. She claims they are not the only government institute that approves marijuana research. If you would come up with a grant that says, okay, this is going to be a treatment for drug addiction, then it would go to us. If it's cancer, it goes to the Cancer Institute. If it is schizophrenia, it goes to NIMH. And so the institutes have a mission with certain diseases. What is clear, there are bureaucratic hoops that most researchers simply don't want to jump through. Neuroscientist Carl Hart. There are not many people studying marijuana. It's very difficult to get approval to study marijuana. What's no nice research. about Israel is that the government is helping the research to happen. And it's research that could give hope to patients like Charlotte Figge. I made it. Scientists in Israel are learning that marijuana use might actually protect the brain, not damage it. Wow! They've been Finally. able to show that it can decrease the amount of brain damage from head injuries right. in mice. To be able to give a medicine after the injury to reverse some of the damage, that's huge. Yeah! You're going to paint your nails? I'll paint your nails. I literally see... What does it say about the donkeys talking about brain damage earlier when when you get real brain damage, you use marijuana to fix it? <laughs> I hope other people notice that contradiction. Charlotte's brain making connections that haven't been made in years. It's almost seeming to build her brain where before it seemed broken. And while scientists Build her are still brain. at the very early stages of knowing if this is actually happening, I can tell you it was remarkable to see her progress. In the three months since we first met her, we saw a change. She was now talking more. Say puppy. She's horseback riding. Good girl. She even rides a bike on her own. And the special strain made for Charlotte is now named for her. It's Charlotte's Web. It is Charlotte's plant. It's Charlotte's plant. Not and Obama wants to shut them all down. Anymore. Now it's for all the children. All, all the, the children, children except for Obama. Charlotte's Web here in Colorado. All of them are reporting significant seizure reduction. And there are dozens more on a wait list. Hoping oh, waiting still. A plant could change their Can't lives. find a doctor. Just like it did for Charlotte. I'm going to get you. So that was Dr. Sanjay Gupta's attempted apology for misleading us years ago when he hadn't done his research. And he evidently do enough this time. I would bet that when the real truth about the good benefits of growing new brain cells on the brains of youth really does get established, Dr. Gupta's going to have to do some more apologizing real soon, I hope.